Hi, everyone. So I want to welcome Dr. Levitsky. He is a gastroenterologist at New Mosey Hospital, and I work with him in the heartburn and reflux program here as well. So over to you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you're in the home stretch. Hang in there. Almost, almost through. And thanks for your attention ahead of time. So I was going to talk today about the endoscopic management of Barrett's esophagus, which involves uh, a variety of tools. Uh, and the outline of my lecture today will include defining what Barrett's is. Most of you know that, but I'll go through that. Uh, this, defining some risk factors for Barrett's esophagus. Go over some uh, of the roles that proton pump, proton pump inhibitors have in the management of Barrett's esophagus. Talk about screening and surveillance strategies for Barrett's, as well as treatment options for dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. So jumping out, out uh, in front, what is Barrett's esophagus? So first of all, um, it is replacement of the normal stratified squamous epithelium at the distal esophagus by a metaplastic columnar type epithelium. So on the periphery of this picture, you see this more pale color uh, of the esophageal lumen and a pinker color in the middle. Uh, it's this pinker color that is the metaplastic columnar type epithelium. Now we know that Barrett's esophagus is a risk factor for esophageal adenocarcinoma. Uh, and it affects over 5% of adults in the United States. Again, and here in the yellow, you'll see the metaplastic columnar type epithelium that defines Barrett's. So when we actually look at the gastrointestinal anatomy, um, there are a variety of terms that we're frequently throwing around, the Z-line, the gastroesophageal junction, and I wanted to actually define what those are. So the Z-line is the junction between squamous type epithelium and columnar type epithelium. It's a visual line that we can see endoscopically. In contrast, the gastroesophageal junction occurs right here, and it is defined as the proximal gastric fold. There isn't really a true line, but we look at the proximal gastric folds, and that's what we call the GEJ. Now, between these, uh, in Barrett's, is where the columnar lined esophagus occurs, and that's the Barrett segment. So if you looked under a microscope in that section, what you'd see is a mucosa that looks more like intestinal type tissue rather than typical standard squamous type epithelium of the esophagus. And this is defined by these um, goblet cells, which have these big balls of, of white in these crypts. That, those are goblet cells, and they just shouldn't be in the esophagus at all. That defines Barrett's. So when we look at the histology of a normal esophagus and Barrett's type epithelium, on the left is the normal stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, and you'll see a lack of goblet cells on this luminal side. Now, as you have esophageal reflux and uh, re reflux esophagitis, it can ultimately lead to that change of the distal esophageal uh, lining, which would include these goblet cells. Now, the role of proton pump inhibitors in Barrett's esophagus is, is an important one. So PPIs are the most effective medical treatment that we have for reflux esophagitis. They'll decrease gastric acid production, decrease the propensity to have reflux into the esophagus, heal established reflux esophagitis, and observational studies suggest that PPIs can prevent carcinogenesis in Barrett's esophagus. So typically what we would do is start once daily PPI therapy and increase, if needed, to eliminate GERD symptoms or to heal esophagitis. Here are some data from a prospective cohort study demonstrating that acid suppression with PPIs reduces the risk of neoplastic progression in Barrett's, in Barrett's patients. In this prospective observational study, involving 540 patients with at least two centimeters of intestinal metaplasia, uh, histology showing either low-grade dysplasia in 14% of patients or no dysplasia in 86, uh, who were followed for a median of 5.2 years, what we see, the cumulative incidence of high-grade dysplasia and cancer was lower in the PPI user group here uh, as compared to PPI non-users. Overall, PPI use was associated with a 75% reduction 
in the risk of neoplastic progression in patients with Barrett's esophagus. So who do we screen for Barrett's? Well, number one, patients with multiple risk factors. So what are they? Age above 50, being male, chronic reflux symptoms, people that are white are at higher risk than other race and ethnicities, uh, central obesity, cigarette use, people with a hiatal hernia, and certainly patients with a family history of either Barrett's esophagus or esophageal cancer. So let's look at that. You have a patient with chronic GERD symptoms and at least one or more risk factors for Barrett's esophagus. What do you do? Well, first, consider screening them with an upper GI endoscopy. If there's no Barrett's, done. No more screening is necessary. If there is Barrett's, well, then the next question is, what about dysplasia? Did those biopsies show any? If there's no dysplasia and the biopsies that were obtained were sufficient uh, and done in a standard protocol, it's reasonable to then survey these patients with endoscopy every three to five years, again, provided that sufficient biopsies were obtained to assess that Barrett segment. And what about patients with either low-grade dysplasia or high-grade dysplasia slash intramucosal cancer? Well, these patients, number one, you would want to confirm the diagnosis of, uh, of either one of those levels of dysplasia by a second expert pathologist, because often there is intra-observer differences uh, on our expert pathology level. Now, clearly, if this is a patient with high-grade dysplasia or intramucosal cancer, we're going to want to go down towards endoscopic eradication of their Barrett segment. The story is a little less clear uh, with patients with low-grade dysplasia. Number one, if a patient has low-grade dysplasia, the first question is, uh, is that low-grade dysplasia really um, demonstrative of that whole segment? So you would certainly want to do an endoscopy with very, very close biopsies somewhere on the order of three to six months, and then closely survey them over time. Alternatively, the preferred approach to managing patients with low-grade dysplasia is similar to high-grade dysplasia, which would be endoscopic eradication of the Barrett segment. Now, it's important to know that degree of dysplasia that's present because the degree of dysplasia will predict the risk of adenocarcinoma in patients. The general population of patients with Barrett's esophagus have uh, incidence of uh, adenocarcinoma of about 0.25% per year. The data for patients with low-grade dysplasia with regards to their risk of adenocarcinoma is poorly defined. And the studies demonstrate this risk all over the map, but generally it's felt to be about 0.54% per year. In contrast, patients with high-grade dysplasia have a risk of Barrett's progressing to adenocarcinoma up from 4 to 8 percent per year. So that's a quite a high number. So clearly, accurate staging is absolutely essential to, de to determine if endoscopic treatment is possible. But with patients with high-grade dysplasia or intramucosal cancer, Generally, lymph node metastases of uh, intramucosal cancer would be very low, on the order of 1% to 2%. And curative endoscopic therapy in such patients is quite feasible. Now, when there's submucosal invasion of an intramucosal in, of cancer, um, it becomes much more prone to metastasize to lymph nodes. So in such patients, you may see lymph node metastases over 10% of the time. And so failure rate for such patients with endoscopic treatment is generally considered to be much higher. Uh, and in general, this would at least be a patient to discuss in a multidisciplinary uh, tumor board before even considering endoscopic treatment. Often these patients instead go to esophagectomy. Uh, so there are techniques that we can use to get deeper into the wall if necessary, if a patient is not a surgical candidate for esophagectomy, uh, provided that endoscopic ultrasound has not shown any sort of lymph
generally, we don't treat submucosal invasion often endoscopically at all. Now, endoscopic mucosal resection is an excellent tool for staging the tumor depth of an intramucosal cancer. So I think about EMR or endoscopic mucosal resection both as a staging procedure and a treatment. So, and essentially this is what's involved. First, we have a scope and we have a little cap on top. If this is the lesion that we're trying to, to raise to get a sense of what it exactly is histologically, we would then in inject a lifting agent like this under the mucosal la layer. We would suck up this lesion right here into the scope. This is a little cap that we can apply suction to and suck this up. Finally, we would then put this snare down the scope over here, snare the lesion and tighten the snare, grasping the, the area of mucosa that is visualized as abnormal. And then we would electro, use electrocautery and cut it off, leaving a mucosal defect. There is a, a different tool that we sometimes use uh, which has a band ligator, these blue rubber bands, um, enable us to suck tissue into the channel of the scope, fire a rubber band around the tissue that you've created a bleb, and then snare that off. So there are two different approaches for EMR that are often deployed. And again, if submucosal invasion is present, we generally steer away from endoscopic therapy uh, in many patients. Sometimes lesions are too big to get a good on-block resection. In, in, and in this situation, uh, we can consider endoscopic submucosal dissection. We've seen this applied in other areas of the body uh, in, in the talk so far today. So in, first on the left, we mark, it, mark the uh, lesion. If this is the lesion here that we want to resect, we first place marks around the lesion, inject a bleb of a lifting agent here in blue, and then start dissecting out the lesion, which is here on top. And we continue dissecting it away. Uh, finally, as we proceed through the dissection, we're able to get an on-block resection with clear margins of a lesion. The most common approach to handling patients with virus esophagus in 2021 is uh, first, very carefully visualize the mucosa endoscopically. And then if you see a visible mucosal irregularity, you first want to proceed with endoscopic mucosal resection. And again, this will stage the lesion that looks visually most advanced, as well as provide therapy. You've removed the most visually advanced disease on block. Following resection of all the visual mucosal irregularities, at a later time, you can then come back and use radiofrequency ablation, uh, maybe every two to three months, allowing time for the sites to heal in between RFA sessions until all the remaining Barrett's type epithelium is eradicated. Now, radiofrequency ablation of Barrett's looks like this, okay? On the very left part of the slide, you're seeing the tip of a device that we have a balloon um, at the tip. And around the balloon, these copper appearing coils are actually the coils that provide radio frequency uh, ablation circumferentially around the wall. So in this insert here of the GI anatomy, you'll see that the balloon is placed distally in the esophagus in a region of the Barrett segment. We then inflate the balloon here. We visualize exactly where that balloon is by placing an endoscope alongside this catheter and making sure that it's just where we need it to be. We inflate the balloon, we step on a cautery pedal, and it electrically will cauter, uh, provide radio frequency ablation to that site. Uh, we actually would do this twice. We would inflate the balloon, go repeat it down the Barrett segment, scrape off the eschar that's created, and do it a second time. And essentially, what you end up with is a picture like this. On the periphery of this slide over here is the normal esophageal non Barrett's type squamous epithelium. And from this point on, you can see this beautiful circumferential ablation going straight down the wall of the esophagus post-ablation. Not only is there a circumferential catheter, there's lots of other devices. So we have long focal catheters that can be placed at the tip of an endoscope, smaller 
uh, little uh, over the scope catheters. We even have a through the scope paddle that can go down the working channel of a standard upper endoscope and provide targeted endoscopic RFA therapy. Now complications of radiofrequency ablation, um, I'd say stricture formation is probably the most common complication. Um, and it is generally a treatable condition where we can then subsequently stretch open most of the strictures that occur. Uh, they occur about 6% of the time. They're more common, I would say, with circumferential ablation than targeted radiofrequency ablation with one of those other catheters. Uh, less common um, complications can include rare bleeding and perforation, which occur less than a percentage of the time. And in general, there are some common post-procedure symptoms. I inform patients that they can expect to have self-limited chest pain. It may last four days, five days, but within a week, they generally, um, the symptom generally goes away. Uh, and I, I prep them for that discomfort. And we use uh, GI elixirs to help manage this discomfort. Uh, I, I frequently will see a low-grade temperature after this, um, but these are self-limited uh, symptoms. Other tools that we have for patients include endoscopic cryotherapy ablation, um, liquid nitrogen or other agents can be used to freeze the esophageal wall in an area of Barrett's, which causes crystal formation intracellularly, which get thawed, and then you can refreeze uh, the Barrett's tissue, ultimately causing cellular death. And in general, uh, this is a good tool. It's not, it, the data isn't as prolific yet as uh, we see with radiofrequency ablation, um, and it's, it's uh, not the preferred modality for flat Barrett's FTM. So how do we manage patients with Barrett's after complete eradication? You've gone through the radiofrequency ablation steps, you have nothing left visually, well, what do you do? So the baseline diagnosis is really important here. If the baseline diagnosis of the patient's segment included high-grade dysplasia or intramucosal cancer, those patients should have an endoscopy at three, six, and 12 months, and then annually thereafter. Over And over time, it's beginning to space it out if you're going years and they have no evidence of Barrett's left. If the baseline diagnosis was of low-grade dysplasia and you've achieved complete endoscopic eradication, the most recent um, expert opinion from 2020 suggested performing an endoscopy at one year and three years, with the caveat being that the natural history of low-grade dysplasia still is all over the map, and it may be reasonable to survey patients more closely than at one year and three years uh, per uh, the most recent iteration of expert opinion and guidelines. And again, managing Barrett's esophagus after eradication includes proton pump inhibitors. It is important to keep reflux symptoms under excellent control and to make sure that at future endoscopies that there is no esophagitis, and if there is, perhaps stepping up and uh, PPI therapy. Thank you, uh, and we'll take questions at the end of the segment.